Okay. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, Paul's defending his visit to Thessalonica. He's defending it against uh, suggestions that it was of no value and that he and his companions were acting out of self-interest that they were trying to fool or take advantage of the Thessalonians. As I said last week, you can, you can just picture this. Here come these, these strangers into Thessalonica. They present this new religion, and now they've got these followers, and then they're gone. They're run out. And you can see the pressure that would be brought to bear on those who are left who are believers and disciples. People would be saying all kinds of things about them and trying to pull them away. And Paul, so he's defending his visit here, and he says in in verses 1 to 8 of chapter 2, he tells the Thessalonians that they know better than what is being suggested to them. Paul and his companions preached the gospel to them in Thessalonica in face of much opposition, and it, it had great effect. They know that. They were courageous, Paul and and Silas and Timothy and whoever else was with them. They were courageous because they were serving the living God. It's not fraudulent. They were courageous because they're serving the living God and, and no huckster would endure what they endured. I mean, that's not the way the huckster works. He comes in for what he can get, and when the going gets difficult, he's gone. And so he tells them that. The Thessalonians and God himself know that at no time did the missionaries use flattery or any other pretext for greed. In other words, they weren't motivated by greed and throwing out things. You know, people don't come in and say, by the way, I'm greedy. I'm trying to take stuff from you. They never do that. They come in and they always have an angle to play. And so he says, we didn't use flattery. We didn't use some pretext for greed. Nor were they seeking any type of emotional payoff in the form of human praise or glorification. We weren't seeking that. That's not what was motivating us. That we'd have people say, oh, you're just so wonderful. You're really great, you know. That wasn't what was driving us. And rather than being a financial burden on the Thessalonians which they rightly could have been, as apostles of Christ, they chose to relieve them of any obligation of support to help establish the Thessalonians in the gospel. So they could have been a financial burden, but they chose not to be. And this gentle handling of their situation, that made the charge of self-interest that was being circulated, it made it doubly absurd. Indeed, he says, they loved the Thessalonians so much that they were pleased to share with them not only the gospel, but themselves. To put themselves at the Thessalonians' disposal. And as I said right when we ended last week, if anybody's being taken advantage of in their visit to Thessalonica, it was Paul, Silas, and Timothy. I mean, by any objective accounting of what's going on, they're the ones who are coming out on the short end. And so Paul is saying this to try to counteract what's being said. Then in verses 9 to 12, let's pick back up there. He says, Indeed, you remember, brothers, our labor and toil while working night and day in order not to burden any of you. We preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God. How devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we acted toward you who believe. How, as you know, we treated each one of you as a father treats his own children. Exhorting and encouraging and imploring you so that you might walk worthily of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I mean, the Thessalonians, they knew very well. They knew very well that the missionaries had not been freeloaders. That they had not been there trying to take from the Thessalonians. Trying to sponge off them. While preaching, they had labored and toiled night and day. 
to provide for their own needs so they wouldn't have to take anything from them. They're working all the time so they would sustain themselves just for this kind of thing. Just so people wouldn't say, you see what they're doing? They're taking advantage of it. He said, we did, you know we didn't do that. God knows we didn't do that. We labored and toiled night and day to provide our own needs. If they were trying to beat somebody out of something, they certainly had a strange way of showing it. Right? I mean, that's pretty odd. Now, the Thessalonians and God witnessed the integrity Witness the integrity with which the missionaries conducted themselves, he says in verses 10 to 12. They acted devoutly, righteously, blamelessly toward the Thessalonians. They were what they claimed to be. They were ambassadors. They were emissaries of God. And they acted as you would expect emissaries of God to act. They reflected God's character in the way they dealt with the Thessalonians. They acted devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly. Their interest wasn't self-aggrandizement. That isn't what they were about. But, the, but to help the Thessalonians, he says, to live lives worthy of God or to walk worthily of God to conduct themselves, to behave in a manner worthy of God. It was toward that end, Paul says, that they spent their time exhorting and encouraging and imploring. Well, what are they doing? Exhorting and encouraging and imploring for what? That you walk worthily of God who calls you. That's, what, that's where he's pouring his energy, his exhortation, his encouragement, his Im imploring, is that they walk worthily of God. They live their lives in a manner worthy of God. In general, to live in a manner worthy of something. To live in a manner worthy of something means to act in accordance with the value and the importance of that thing. To act with a proper appreciation of that thing's worth. To live worthily of God in the sense that Paul means is not to live sinlessly. That would be great, but that will not happen until the eternal state. But that would be great. But that's not what Paul is talking about. Rather, to live worthily of God is to live devoutly. To live piously striving in all seriousness to live as God would have us live because he's worthy of such submission and effort and self-denial. He's worthy of that. For us to be serious about how we live in response to the grace that he's given us. This desire for Christians to walk worthily of God, to live worthy of the God who calls us, to live as He would have us live. Dare I say, to heed His do's and don'ts? You see, this desire is often expressed by Paul. It's not just here. Paul says, for example, in Ephesians 4.1, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you, therefore, to walk worthily of the calling to which you were called. Philippians 1.27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Colossians 1.10, in order that you may walk worthily of the Lord. And we'll see in, in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, he says he instructed them how they must walk so as to please God. This isn't some minor thing. This isn't some trivial thing. The Lord Jesus himself says in Revelation 3, 4, Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me, for they are worthy. Now when we say, nobody's worthy, nobody, do you think Paul doesn't understand that? Do you think Paul doesn't understand that in that absolute sense, no one is worthy? And yet... There's some meaning to his calling us to live worthy. 
And that's what I'm telling you. What it is is this, this idea of living piously, devoutly, seriously in your pursuit of godliness. Living seriously the way God would have you live because that says He is worthy of that submission, that obedience, that self-denial. He's worthy of that. And that's what Paul is saying here. Now, Paul's focus with these new Christians, it's on their sanctification. It's on their sanctification. You see, he says, exhorting, encouraging, imploring you so that you might walk worthily of God. It's on their living, surrendered, obedient lives. He didn't just come in and say, by the way, you're a sinner, you're saved by grace, believe in Jesus. When he did that, He spent his time trying to forge them into the image of Jesus. Trying to get them to understand that part of the response to this tremendous grace of Almighty God is that we then are obligated to live lives worthy of Him. We are obligated to be holy people. And he spent his time urging them that way. And I worry that we are sometimes in the church today that we're more concerned with making people comfortable. That we're more concerned with appealing to their wants so they'll choose to join our group or to stay with our group. We're more concerned with that than with calling them to live crucified lives to the glory of God. We shy away. From feeding people the truth of how God would have us live. Exhorting them. Urging them. Imploring them to live righteous lives. Because we fear it will turn off people. In our culture who don't want a religion that challenges their truth. Of what constitutes moral living. They don't want to hear. That God would have you be this way and not that way. Who are you? Who are you to say that? I just want to be with a group of people I find comfortable and friendly, but I don't want to be called to a radical righteousness that will glorify God. And I don't see Paul doing that. I see Paul laboring to bring them to walk worthily of God. You see, this idea, it winds up, it's a bargain with the devil because it deprives the church of the instruction, the exhortation, the encouragement it needs to walk this way, to live this way, to behave this way, to conduct itself this way, to live moral lives. You cannot instruct people on how to live as God would have you live without laying out for them. This is how God would have you be. And you're going to see Paul do it. Paul will not shy away from sexual immorality in chapter 4. Do you think these people, you know, Paul says, look, this is what it means to be a Christian. You live this way. You live in conformity with the will of God. He says in 13 to 16, and on account of this... We constantly give thanks to God. On account of what? That having received the word you heard from us about God, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it truly is, the word of God, which is also at work among you who believe. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea, Because you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they suffered from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, who drove us out, who displeased God, and who are opposed to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, thus continually filling up the measure of their sins, but the anger against them has reached the limit. Now they constantly give thanks to God that the Thessalonians accepted their preaching about God for what it is. 
They accepted it for what it is, the Word of God, and not the Word of men. You see, the gospel, the good news of God acting to rescue fallen creation through the death, resurrection, and ascension of His Son, Jesus Christ, that is a divine revelation. That is not something somebody crafted or figured out, reasoned their way to. God has poured that truth into this world. It is a divine revelation. It's therefore unadulterated truth. Now, we can accept it or we can reject it, but what we cannot do is make it over into our image. We can accept it or reject it. But we can't change it, we can't alter it, because it's divine truth. They're thankful that they accepted the gospel as the word of God, because in doing that, in accepting it as the word of God, they gave that message the trust that that message deserves. The Thessalonians, they weren't tentative, and they weren't reserved in their acceptance. They weren't thinking, well, I'm not sure, let's test drive this. Let's see if it works out. I'll give part of this, and then I'll wait. That's not how they, they accepted it as the word of God. When God comes in and says, this is the truth, this is reality, you can either sit back and go, Mm, let me think now oh no or you can say that's the word of God and embrace it and receive it and that's what they did they embraced it they received it they accepted it they wholeheartedly embraced the message as truth and they acted accordingly they acted accordingly that word he says was at work among them transforming them through their acceptance of it. That's what happens. He comes and plants this truth in this pagan society. They accept it as the Word of God. And then look what's happening. Look what this Word is doing. It's creating this transformed new people in the midst of darkness. And it is at work among them doing its work as the Spirit of God uses that Word and transforms people. Now, evidence of their accepting the Gospel as God's Word and of its impact on them, that evidence of that was the fact that they suffered for their faith in the same way that the churches in Judea had suffered. You see, this is evidence of their acceptance and their transformation is that they suffered for their faith the way the churches in Judea suffered, meaning that they were persecuted by their own countrymen. That's what happened to the churches in Judea. They were persecuted. That's what happened to the Gentile believers in Thessalonica. The people in that community persecuted them. Persecution is a natural concomitant of the Christian faith. You could see, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4, that Lord willing will get to. John 15, 18 and 19. John 17, 14. 2 Timothy 3, 12. You see, it's a natural part of it. Because by accepting and presenting the message of truth, by believing this message, by holding that message out, By living in conformity with that message, living with the Word of God, Christians, they expose human rebellion and false religion. They do that. See, when we hold that this is the truth, and we tell people about that, and we live according to it, that's what we're doing. So those engaged in rebellion and engaged in false religion, they resent it. And they hate it. So it's not a secret. You know, so this idea that, no, 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 no. You come in and it's, it's no, no, that's not what Christian living is. You have to understand what the norm is in this fallen world. The zeal that endures persecution. It's rooted in a conviction that the gospel is bigger than this life. It's the news of God's acting in Christ. 
to heal the sin-sick creation. The kingdom of God has been inaugurated or sown. And by the power and working of God, it will at Christ's return, it will become the eternal and perfect state of joy, peace, love, and fellowship that fulfills all human longing. It fulfills all human longing. You know, the question comes up, well, what will you do in heaven and in the eternal state? And as I always say in my perverse analogy, you, so, you know the situation. Sometimes people who take drugs, who spend their life chasing the high that they got, and they sometimes will tell you, when I first took that, I got to a place I never wanted to leave. Okay, well, do you see there's the idea of complete and full satisfaction. Now, how that's all going to work out, that's going to be in heaven. You're not going to be in heaven in the eternal state saying, you know what? I really would have chosen option B. It's not going to be that way. Now, all the particulars you will learn, I pray. Now, so, so this, this idea, you see, this is what is going to happen. This is what's in store. So no temporary suffering. No temporary suffering is worth abandoning this hope or the God who provides it. So this is the perspective. This is the conviction, you see, that sees the gospel is bigger than this life. That's what endures persecution. You see, is that I understand that I'm living this life, but there's an eternity in store for me. And then Paul, in verse 15, he comments on the persecuting activity of the unbelieving Jews. He says, they killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. Now, in saying that they killed the Lord Jesus, he means, of course, that they instigated the Lord's crucifixion by the Romans. And the only other place where Paul specifies the agents of Jesus' death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, he says they are the rulers of the age, which I take to be the rulers of Rome and the rulers of Israel who, acting in the perversity of the world's wisdom, they were led to the ultimate wrong action, crucifying the Lord of glory. So Paul says here, they... they Killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets. Now, as for their killing the prophets, you see, as Jeffrey Wyman says in his commentary, he says, By New Testament times, therefore, the killing of the prophets had become a common way to refer to the persecution of the faithful remnant within Israel by the unrighteous. You see, so it wouldn't have to be literal because it seems by the first century this had become like a term of art that stood for the persecution of the righteous remnant by those who were unrighteous. So when he says they crucified, they killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, he could simply be saying that they were the persecutors of the church. You see this kind of connection in Acts 7, right? Where the people wind up getting linked to the Old Testament Jews who, who literally killed the prophets. You see this notion of, well, you're kind of from, you're cut from the same cloth. You see, you guys are, are, uh, have a common spirit. You remember here he says, you stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you've now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels, but did not keep it. So you see here, here's a first century example of a linking of them. So in any event, he says, talking about the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, he says, look, they wind up, they kill both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. Now it is possible that when he says they kill the prophets, that he's referring to their killing of Christian prophets. Now that's a possibility. You recall that in Matthew chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus predicted the killing of prophets he would send. Okay, so I have to say, well, it, well maybe that they had killed some prophets 
Christian prophets. But there's no, there are no clear examples of Christian prophets having been killed before the date of this letter. It's around 50. And there are no examples of prophets being killed. Certainly there were well-known martyrs. There was Stephen. There was James, the son of Zebedee. But none of them is specifically identified as a prophet. So I'm, I'm not sure that that's what Paul is talking about. I think it's more likely that he's saying, look, they killed the Lord Jesus and they are cut from the same cloth as those who killed the prophets. They are anti-righteous remnant. So I think that's what he's talking about with the Jews. Then he says, they drove us, the missionaries, out. They drove us out. He says in verse 15, the second part, probably referring to how they had been treated in Thessalonica and Berea. Right? The Jews had driven them out of those places and he says they displease God well of course they displease God they displease God because they're opposing God's work in Christ God is doing something ever since the fall mankind has been waiting what is the solution what is going to happen when are things going to be put right and here comes Jesus saying the kingdom of God is at hand the kingdom of God is among you. I am introducing God's final solution. And what do they do? Well, these people, these unbelieving Jews, the people Paul's talking about, they oppose it at every turn. They don't like it. And so this is what he's talking about. He says, when he says that, they displease God. He says they're opposed to all mankind. Well, they're opposed to humanity in the sense they prevent the missionaries from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. I mean, how else do you hate people in keeping from them the message they need to be saved? The fact you do that says you don't care a thing about those people. And so that's what's happening. And so he's talking about these unbelieving Jews. Now the clear implication is that unless the Gentiles are spoken to, they won't be saved. Right? This comes up sometimes because we wonder, well, what about those who haven't heard? Those who have earned their damnation by sinning against the revelation that they do have, mankind being without excuse, well, it seems to me they have to get the message because he says here that they're preventing them from going to the Gentiles and giving them the message they need to be saved. And this squares with what you see in Romans 10, 13, and 15. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one in whom they did not believe? And how can they believe on one whom they did not hear? And how can they hear without one preaching? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how welcome are the feet of those proclaiming good news of good things. See, so I, just, I see Paul saying they are enemies of mankind because they are bent on shutting us up. And we are the only hope that mankind has. And so they show that antipathy and that hostility to humanity by acting this way. Now Paul, Paul says that they, they thus continually, in this opposition to what God is doing, they continually fill up the measure of their sins. God has been amazingly patient with them. He's been amazingly patient with them. But his anger, the cup of his wrath, has now reached the limit. It has now reached the limit, he says here in 16b and c. Paul seems to be suggesting, at least the way I read it, he seems to be suggesting that God's wrath has begun to be poured out on the Jews, but Paul's specific referent isn't clear. He seems to be saying that their hostility, that the cup of God's wrath is filled and he is now pouring out wrath on the Jews, but he doesn't spell out. Well, what do you mean pouring it out on them? How? 
What is he doing? Perhaps he was thinking of the trouble that the Romans had recently brought on the Jews. You remember this? He's, Paul's writing this letter. He's writing from, this thing keeps popping. He's writing from Corinth, and it's A.D. 50. Now, you remember that a, within a, just a year ago or less, in A.D. 49, the Roman emperor Claudius, he had expelled all the Jews from Rome. That event's referred to in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And that same year, 49, thousands of Jews were killed in Jerusalem, perhaps in reprisal for the violence of certain Jewish nationalists. So you can see they're expelled from Rome, thousands of them are killed, and this conflict with Rome and the Jews, it continued to smolder and spark during the, rain, during the remainder of Cumanus's term. Cumanus was the procurator of Palestine. He's the guy in the same position as Pilate. And he served there from 48 to 52. And you continue to have this difficulty and this conflict and confrontation, and things only got worse. When Felix became procurator of Palestine, and he served in that capacity from 52 to 59. He ruthlessly stamped out any type of insurgent activity. And in doing so, Josephus, who is the first century Jewish historian, in, in Felix's ruthlessly stamping out any kind of insurgent activity during his reign from 52 to 59, Josephus says that he crucified an incalculable number of people. So it looks like there's a real hard time falling on the Jewish people. And from 49 all the way through, and so Felix leaves in 59, and then the Jewish revolt. You see all of this hostility and friction and tension that's smoldering and sparking, people getting killed, Rome doing this, and then in 66, just seven years, it's just seven years after Felix's term as procurator, you have the full-blown Jewish war. And that, of course, leads to the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, the destruction the Lord Jesus had prophesied. And then in a year or two after that, you have the fall of Masada. So I, I think this is what Paul is talking about, is he sees already the outpouring of this punishment and this wrath on Israel. Now, Paul obviously is not anti-Jewish, right? I mean, nobody can read Romans 9, 1 to 5 and think that Paul is anti-Jewish. He's a Jew. And he loves his people dearly. He's speaking of hard-hearted Jews. Those who don't have the faith of Abraham. He's speaking of those who refuse to accept and to actively oppose God's purpose in Christ. They are opponents of humanity. They are out with God. And God's wrath is filled up. And I think that's what Paul is saying. He says in 1720, But we, brothers, having been orphaned from you for a short time in person, not in heart, endeavored intensely with great desire to see your face. For we resolve to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did once and again. But Satan thwarted us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of glorying in the presence of our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? Yes, you are our glory and joy. Now here are the missionaries, Paul and his companions. They describe their forced separation from the Thessalonians as having been orphaned. You see, playing off the intensity of the parent-child relationship. They also assure them that it was only a physical separation. It wasn't a separation of affection. We may have been booted out, but that didn't do anything for how much we love you and how devoted we are to you. 
And in response to that separation, they sought fervently and with great desire to see the Thessalonians again, having resolved to return, to go back to them. Paul interjects that he certainly did on more than one occasion. But Satan thwarted their efforts. Satan thwarted their efforts. Now, we're not told how Satan blocked their return. We're not told whether there were guards stationed who knew Paul and the other guys, whether the members of the church in Thessalonica had been threatened that if these people show up, this is going to happen to you. We don't know if it had been something by weather, by illness, By some other means, we're simply not told. Nor are we told how they knew it was Satan rather than the Holy Spirit who had directed them in Acts 16. In Acts 16, they knew it was the Spirit sending them a Troas. But we're not told. But what we are told is that Satan blocked their way and they knew it. So Satan was behind this. And this is this idea of this ongoing spiritual battle. When I tell you, if you don't realize that, if you simply think that this is all there is, and you're just bumping around here, and you don't realize... Now, I know how people look at that. You talk about a spiritual dimension and these kinds of things. You talk about a demonic realm in our society. People go, oh, that guy's crazy. No, I believe the Bible. (laughs) That's that's who I am. I believe the Bible. And it's very plain that there's a spiritual war going on. And in some way, that dimension or realm is able to influence this one. And so here you have Satan thwarting that, this spiritual battle. As good fruit of the missionary's labor for Christ as evidence of the manner in which they had faithfully discharged their commission, the Thessalonians, they will be a blessing. They will be a well-done, good and faithful servant for the missionaries at the return of Christ. So the Thessalonians, they can't doubt the missionaries' concern for their spiritual welfare. Now what I smell back here The fact Paul is saying this, I smell as part of the assault on their visit, trying to uh, take away their influence and turn the people from their conversion. I get the idea of people saying, well, you know, uh, not only were they here just trying to get something from you, but they don't really care about you. This was a drive-by visit. Where are they? They came in, sucked you in, blew out, and left you with the damage. Now your family hates you, your neighbors hate you, everybody's after you, and where are they? They don't care about you. It's on to the next mark. They're just traveling around, seeing what they can get. And so Paul is telling them, look, you are our glory. You are the fruit and the evidence that we have faithfully labored in the cause of Christ. So how can you think that we're not concerned about your spiritual welfare? Of course I'm concerned about your spiritual welfare. I want you to be there. And then that will be part of what we have in well done, good and faithful servant. Chapter 3, 1 to 5, he says, Therefore, when we could no longer bear it, We decided to be left in Athens. You remember they were in Athens when they sent them, and then Paul goes to Corinth. We decided to be left in Athens by ourselves and sent Timothy, our brother and fellow worker for God and the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions. They're being persecuted just like the churches in Judea were persecuted by their countrymen. They're getting the hammer. And he says, I'm concerned about the effect this is going to have on you. I'm away. And so I sent Timothy to find out to encourage you for the sake of your faith so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions. Indeed, you yourselves know that 
that we Christians are destined for this. For even when we were with you, for even when we were with you, we were predicting to you that we would be afflicted. And so it turned out, as you know. It wasn't a surprise. I told you when I was there, that was the lot of our life. And it bore out right there. You saw how we were treated. He says, for this reason, I myself, being no longer able to bear it, sent to learn about your faith, fearing that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor had been in vain. The tempter had tempted you. Do you think he just parachuted in? Or do you think he was tempting them through the difficulties and persecution? Well, how's that possible? How's it possible for an immaterial being to... Look, uh, that's my voice of the person who thinks he knows everything. Okay? This is what God is revealing. This is what God is revealing. That's what Paul was concerned about, about the tempter. Their concern for the Thessalonians' welfare. It became so great, it became unbearable that they sent Timothy to them to strengthen them and encourage them in the faith so that they, the Thessalonian Christians, wouldn't be shaken by the difficulties and hardships and afflictions and persecution that they were experiencing. The Thessalonians knew that Christians are destined for afflictions. For when the missionaries were there, they predicted it. That they would be afflicted just as it turned out. See, Paul doesn't want any of us to be surprised by persecution. No one. See, he doesn't want anyone to take opposition as a sign that Christianity's not working. Christianity's false. If it were true, then God would have me in a bubble and I wouldn't be suffering. I'd be the one riding in the Cadillac. And that is not the Christian faith. The Christian faith is a call to come and die. And in this dark world, until the Lord returns, there will be plenty of opposition. I know the bell's going to ring in a second, but let me read to you this quote from Jeffrey Weimer, Weimer in his commentary. He says, This belief that the Christian faith inevitably evokes opposition and suffering is a conviction common not only to Paul, and he cites places where Paul shows this, but also other New Testament writers. It's not like Paul's the Lone Ranger. Everybody understands this. He says this widespread and consistent testimony of Scripture leads best. That's Ernest Best. He's a commentator on Thessalonians. Prior generation. I heard that bell. He said leads best to forward the maxim. Normality is persecution. Doesn't mean you can't be in an era and a time where things are different. Normality is persecution. There is no justification here or anywhere else in Scripture for a health and wealth gospel in which believers are guaranteed a life free from difficulty and suffering. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming. Next week, Lord willing.